The man trudged through the harsh winter snow. He loved the sound of boots stepping on snow as he walked. Everyone else was inside where it was warm, but not him. Unlike everyone else in town, this was where he came alive. It was not the cold itself, but the prospect of what he might find that had kept him coming out here for almost 50 years. Looking around at all the snowflakes flying past him, he knew that today he would find plenty. Virtuous Men, a podcast devoted to sharing the lives of men of history, fiction, and today, and the virtues they personify. Welcome to Episode 5 of our mini-pod series, The Passion of Wilson Bentley, hosted by Scott Einig. A virtue is a behavior one conforms to in order to achieve a moral and ethically principled life through action. A virtuous man is one who is well aware of how he falls short, yet chooses not to allow his flaws to define him as he seeks to better himself. Such men show that it is possible to overcome the things that keep us from achieving our destinies. Though each man is flawed and imperfect, it is in the lives of flawed men that we see the possibility for virtue in our own lives. This episode's virtue is passion. Passion is defined by expressing great interest in, devotion to, and love for an activity, set of skills, or field of interest. Whether it involves endless hours studying a topic, building up a large body of work, or pursuing ways to better the lives of others, such people are described as passionate. They could talk for days about their passions, and in some cases, spend much time trying to bring their passions to the world. One such example is Wilson Bentley, a man whose unusual hobby went on to open the world's eyes to one of the natural world's unseen marvels. Wilson Bentley was born in the small farming town of Jericho, Vermont, in February 1865. From his youngest days, Wilson was a curious and perceptive child, showing a devout interest in the natural world around him. He was particularly fascinated by ice, clouds, rain, frost, and snowflakes. He was fortunate to live in a part of the world that saw an average snowfall of 120 inches. The farming community dreaded the coming of winter, but Wilson couldn't wait. Though he rarely attended school, his mother taught him at home. The family possessed an encyclopedia collection, which Wilson read eagerly. When he was 15 years old, his mother gave him a microscope for his birthday a gift that he later said would open the door to his life's work. He recalled that while other boys played typical boy games, he was busy looking at things under his microscope. Whether it was a bird feather or flower petal or butterfly wing, nothing escaped his careful scrutiny. But when he placed snowflakes under the lens, his lifelong passion was ignited. Wilson studied snowflakes for the next two years, attempting to draw what he saw on paper. Knowing that drawings could never truly capture what he saw, he knew that what he really needed was a camera. He was surprised to learn that there were cameras that were capable of photographing things through a microscope lens. He somehow managed to obtain one, and Wilson got to work. Knowing nothing about photography, he spent much time experimenting with various techniques through much trial and error. Slowly but surely, he became better at his craft. The moment of breakthrough came in January of 1885, a blizzard had come over Jericho, and Wilson, after one year of painstaking work, achieved what no one before him had ever done. He successfully photographed an individual snowflake. He said later that, The day that I developed the first negative made by this method, and found it good, I felt almost like falling on my knees beside that apparatus and worshipping it. It was the greatest moment of my life. Over the next decade, Wilson built up an enormous catalog of plates and images. By this time, he had his photography technique down to a science. He would go outside and catch snowflakes onto a tray lined with black velvet. He would then use a feather to delicately lift a single crystal onto a pre-chilled microscopic plate. This method prevented the crystal from melting or changing shape, a common problem for snowflake photography. 
His research led to many interesting discoveries, the most prominent being the idea that no two snowflakes are exactly the same. Though the scientific community had not known much about what Wilson was doing, Professor George Perkins of the University of Vermont encouraged Wilson to write about his findings. He published his first paper in Popular Science Monthly in 1898, which not only showcased his research, but the passion with which he wrote about it. He often described his work in poetic ways, referring to snowflakes as tiny miracles of beauty, or, when describing their life among the clouds, as dainty hieroglyphics. Following this first article, Wilson expanded his research into other weather phenomena, becoming something of a full-blown meteorologist. He applied his unique powers of observation to rain, dew, and frost, and recorded the weather multiple times a day. He even created a method for determining the size of raindrops that is still in use today. Covering a tray with flour, he would quickly place the tray under the rain for a few seconds before covering it again. The raindrops made dried pellets of dough, which would then reveal their size. Over the next seven years, he studied over 70 storms and wrote a number of papers on the subject of rainfall and raindrops, which some say remain unparalleled in their sheer amount of discoveries. Even during all this activity, Wilson always made time for people. Though he never married, he remained a lifelong resident of Jericho, and his calm demeanor and sense of humor made him a beloved figure among the townsfolk and neighbors. He joked that, given what he was doing and the exuberant way he talked about it, he had a feeling his neighbors thought he was a little crazy. Even when he was forced to admit that, despite his good relations with his fellow Jericho citizens, they didn't really understand him or have much interest in what he was doing. Especially disappointing was the lack of response from the scientific community, perhaps due to the fact that Wilson was not a college-educated scientist, and that so much of his work was far ahead of his time, the world of science was largely silent. Despite the loneliness of his work and lack of proper recognition, nothing could tear Wilson away from his work. After 1910, Wilson changed directions in how he pursued his passions. He wrote frequent articles for magazines as well known as National Geographic, Popular Mechanics, and the New York Times Magazine. He would ultimately produce a staggering 5,000 snowflake photographs. The best of these plates were reproduced in a book called Snow Crystals, an appropriately gorgeous showcase for his life's work that remains in print today. Wilson also sold many of these plates to colleges around the country, and even gave lectures at various institutes, museums, and universities. He became known in the 1920s as Snowflake Bentley, and, in 1924, was given a grant by the American Meteorological Society. Finally, he had received the recognition he so richly deserved. In 1931, Wilson made what would be his last weather entry. One week later, he headed out into a typically frigid Vermont blizzard with his camera in tow. It was the same camera he had used for over 40 years to capture the tiny miracles that now furiously swirled around him. A few days later, Wilson was clearly sick. A doctor was called, though sadly, it had been too late. Wilson died of pneumonia two days before Christmas. He was 66 years old. To most people, what Snowflake Bentley was doing would seem to be a waste of time. But to Wilson, every moment behind the camera, catching raindrops or studying storms, was time spent living life to its fullest. He did not seek fame or monetary gain. He did not try to become a leading figure in his field. Wilson just wanted to capture beauty in the snow and make sure everyone could see what he saw. In the most literal way, Wilson died doing what he loved. His unique work not only gave the world a better understanding of winter's beauty, but it gave us a glimpse into the beauty of human passion. This episode of Virtuous Men was written and recorded by Scott Einig and edited by Jamie Adams. If you enjoyed this episode, give us a rating and leave a review in the comments section. 
And don't forget to check out more Virtuous Men on our Instagram page at virtuous underscore men and give us a follow. Tune in next time for Minipod number six, The Responsiveness of Nehemiah.